Last month, I guess it's two months ago now, in April, uh, this news article ran. A high school in Connecticut has accepted a new boy on their track team. Except he won't be going to the boys' track team. He will be going to the girls' team. Andrea Yearwood, a freshman and biological male from Cromwell High School in Connecticut, identifies as a girl and recently received permission to join the girls' track team after competing as a boy in middle school. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> Yearwood has been extremely successful as a male competing against females. This kind of confusion is happening all over our culture. And why is it happening? Well, because right now, the prevailing notion of love in our society says it is unloving to tell someone who is a boy, you're a boy, and to tell a girl, you're a girl. That, that's unloving. We can't do that right now. And yet I can't help thinking in this sort of situation, what about those girls who are missing possible scholarship money? Is it loving to them? So right now we have, I don't know if you've noticed, we have a massive clash going on in our culture amongst definitions of love. In every single culture, in every single day and age, love will always need to be defined. Always. You can't just say, well, love each other and have that be a universal statement. It will always have to be defined. What is that? What does love look like? And whoever gets to define love in a culture gets to be God. And right now, a whole lot of people are vying for that position in our culture. I want to say what love is. I get to say what love is. And in fact, we've been told that each and every one of us gets to say that for ourselves. We get to define that for ourselves. And what we end up with is a big, huge, tr excuse me, train wreck. And we're beginning to see that as we clash and we crash into one another's definitions of love. And I'd submit to you that whenever humans do the defining of love according to our whims and caprices, we wind up with a mess. Obviously, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, believe that God gets to define love in His Word. So let's look at that this morning in 1 Corinthians, where we see Paul says that submitted love pleases God. Love gone wild pleases demons. Whoa. You have your attention yet? Let's bow with me. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. God, it is precious. It is holy. It is powerful. Lord, it has the ability to cut through the confusion of our day and age and the confusion in our hearts. So, Lord, would you please speak clearly to us this morning? I pray that I would not get in the way. Lord, your word is clear, so help me to be clear as well as I explain and show what it is you are saying to us today through your word. God, give us ears to hear, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, submitted love pleases God. Love on the train tracks, if you will, pleases God. Love off those tracks pleases demons. That's what we're going to find out in our text. But before we jump into the second half of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we have been out of the flow of 1 Corinthians for a long time. We've been talking about the resurrection, and we need to go back about six weeks to 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 and take a running leap into this text or it's going to make absolutely no sense. So really quickly, these are all freebies. In chapters 8 and 9 in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, that submitted love knows that the purpose of moral freedom is others, not self. This is the first train track, if you will. Submitted love knows that the purpose of moral freedom is others, not self. In chapters 8 and 9, Paul talks about what we would term Christian liberty. And you might think back to those sermons that Pastor Matt did on Christian liberty. Really quickly, Christian liberty can be defined very easily in this diagram. In Scripture, there are some things that are green lights, clearly commanded, do this. In Scripture, there are some things that are clearly red lights, don't do this. And in the middle, there are some things that are eh, a little gray. I'm supposed to pursue purity. 
So how much impurity is allowable in the movie that I watch? I'm supposed to give money generously. I'm also supposed to save. Should I have a vacation home or should I send that money to Africa? These sorts of issues fall into that middle area of, I'm not always sure exactly what the best way to please God is. And Paul argues in chapters 8 and 9 that there is freedom, there is liberty in Christ. There is tremendous freedom when we are on the tracks. In Christ, when we submit to God, we find freedom. Far from being constricted and confined, there's freedom. So Paul's example in chapters 8 and 9 is a little weird to us in our day and age. But he says, if you were to walk into Wegmans and there was a sign up that said, some of the meat we're selling has been offered to Buddha, what should you do? Should you buy it or not? And Paul says, yeah, go ahead and buy it. Don't worry about it. Buddha's not a real god and the meat is just meat, so don't ask any questions and just go ahead and buy it. Then he goes on into chapter 10, where we find out, again, this is all freebies. We haven't even gotten to the real, the real message yet. In chapter 10, he says, submitted love grasps the communal effects of sin. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Matt preached on communion. And Paul makes the point that if you partake of Christ, you partake of Christians. That's why in chapter 10, verse 14, he says, look with me there in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Why? Well, verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, the communion cup, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And all God's people said, yes, it is. Verse 17, because there's one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Whoa, what's he saying? He's saying that communion isn't just about you and Jesus, it's about you and the body of Christ. And if you come into communion with unrepentant sin, you bring that into the camp. It's not just you that gets affected by that, but the whole body is to some extent affected by that. And then he uses another example in verse 18 and says, look at the people of Israel. When they offer something on the altar, they're all participating in that sacrifice. And this is where we come to our text this morning. Done with the freebies. Everybody sit up straight and listen carefully. Here we go. <clears throat> Paul's listeners at this point are going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were just talking about when I go and I buy meat that's been offered to idols, that that's no big deal. But it sure sounds like you're saying, if I eat of that meat that I'm then, that's been offered on the idol's altar, that I'm then participating with that idol. So I'm really confused. Everybody scratch your head. I'm really confused here. Am I supposed to eat it or am I not supposed to eat it? Am I participating in idolatry or am I not participating in idolatry? And this is where we begin to see that submitted love, here's the key, submitted love does everything for another's sake. Here's your first real point. Get your pens out. Submitted love does everything for another's sake. Paul begins to give some guidelines, some more specific guidelines about how to make decisions in these categories. And while, stick with me, because while this scenario is a little weird to us, it has broader applications and principles. So hang with me. I know most of you don't face the situation of eating food offered to idols every day, but stick with me, okay? The first thing that he says in verse 19 is that love gone wild is demonic. So if submitted love does everything for another's sake, there's another way I can use what is false love. And love gone wild is demonic. Verse 19, what do I imply then? Look with me at verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. So really clearly, Paul says, look, if you carve a rock to look like Buddha, it's still just a rock. You set a piece of meat in front of the rock, it's still just a piece of meat. But, verse 20, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. What's he saying? He's saying when an idolater kneels down and puts that in front of the idol, to them it is an act of worship to a real entity behind that stone god. And that entity is a demon. Whoa. He says, I don't want you to be participants with demons. 
you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Should we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You say, okay, all right, I get it. Like, I'm not supposed to eat food offered to idols. Big whoop. Um, this actually does have some specific application to us today. Because those of you who live in King of Prussia know we, there's a really large Hindu population in King of Prussia. And Lord willing, someday, wouldn't it be wonderful if we start reaching them for Christ? Now, what happens if you get invited over for dinner and they tell you, oh, all the food tonight has been offered to Vishnu? What do you do? Now, that's an unlikely scenario right now for many of us, but it does still have application today. One of our members just did a wedding for some folks who worship the Hindu gods. These issues do come up even in our culture today. What do you do? Well, it's still a little unclear, but we got this much. Paul says, there is a way in which I can take my liberty so far that it's not Christian liberty. I've gone completely off the tracks, and I am now participating in things that demons want me to participate in. Anybody want to say, um, I don't want to do that? Whatever that is, I would like to not cross that line. I would like to not go off those tracks. But I could still use a little clarity. Anybody with me? I could still use a little bit of clarity on what is he talking about? So, okay, I can go off the tracks. I get that much, but I'm still a little fuzzy. Well, he goes on in ver verses 23 and following, and he tells us that submitted love, again, limits itself for others. I I'm repeating myself a lot, I know, but you're getting the point? Submitted love <laughs> limits itself for others. Look with me at verse 23. In verse 23, one of Paul's imaginary opponents pipes up and he says, um, <clears throat> all things are lawful. You just told me that in chapters 8 and 9. But, Paul says, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Read others. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Okay, and here he gives the bottom line. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Keep that verse in mind. So he says, look, you go to Wegmans and they've got a sign up and it says, some of our meat has been offered to Buddha. Just buy the meat and eat it. Don't ask, was this, what about, which steak was it? Just buy the meat and eat it, okay? Don't worry about it. If, verse 27, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, Eat whatever's set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Don't sit there and say, what about that one? Was that offered to a pagan god? But, verse 28, if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his. What's he saying? He's saying, if that idolater says to you, that stake was offered to my idol, he's watching you to see what you do. And by eating it, you're going to be saying to him, yeah, I'm okay with idol worship. So for the sake of his conscience, don't do it. It's not that the meat has changed properties mystically. It's that you're going to send a wrong message to him. So limit your freedom for the sake of someone else. Love on the tracks limits itself for the sake of others. So here's a more uh, general example. Actually, no, we're going to get to that in a minute. Before we get there, here's the flip side. The flip side is that submitted love also enjoys earthly things for God's sake and doesn't let curmudgeons tarnish it. Submitted love enjoys everything for God's sake and doesn't let curmudgeons tarnish it. Because Paul also talks about, not only is this for the sake of unbelievers, but we're supposed to limit our Christian liberty for the sake of weaker Christian brothers and sisters. So here's my example. I went to a really, really conservative Christian college. And when I say conservative, I really mean legalistic. There were some great people there, a lot of people who really loved Jesus. They were also really good at making human rules into God's rules. And one of them had to do with the kinds of music you could listen to. And I remember having a discussion with 
a, a, an acquaintance, he wasn't a close friend, especially after this discussion, but an acquaintance where he was telling me that the, the, the Christian music I listened to was so bad that he questioned my salvation. And I was like, what? And I remember during those years really wrestling with this concept of limiting myself for the sake of others, using my Christian liberty wisely, because here's the deal. If I limit myself down to whoever has the narrowest standards, I am going to miss out on a whole lot of things that God meant for me to enjoy. Back to that verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says that God meant for us to enjoy these good pleasures. So what do I do with the curmudgeons? What do I do with the people who are like, you can't enjoy that. That's unholy. What do I do with those people? Well, what I ought to have done with my Christian brother in college was I should have tried to educate his conscience. I, so I don't blast my music in his presence because he thinks that's sinful and I don't want to cause him to violate his conscience. But I should also try to educate his conscience to say, look, Scripture doesn't forbid this and give him time to think through that. Now, if he still says, no, that's ungodly and unwholesome and I ain't doing it. He didn't quite talk like that, by the way. Um, <laughs> then at that point, I say, we, we, it's what we would call a professional weaker brother. And it's like, look, you're not going to stumble in your walk with Christ if I listen to this music. You have your conviction, and that's fine, and I'm going to enjoy what I think the Lord has given me to enjoy. And that's exactly what Paul says in uh, the second half of verse 29. He says, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? And here's the bottom line, verses 31 through 33. The bottom line is whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that, we, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. He's not saying he lives in fear of man. But he says, everything I do is with the goal of trying to get more people to know Jesus and to love Jesus. Stop and think about that for a minute. Everything you do for the goal of seeing others love Jesus more, that ought to really radically shift your thinking. It shifted mine this week. That is a high, high goal, and it shows us how sinful and wicked our hearts are. Because how often do you live like that? How often do I live like that? Everything you do for the purpose of God's glory and the salvation of others. You see, that is the purpose of Christian liberty. Often we treat Christian liberty like, well, I'm under grace, so yeah, I can go to this R-rated movie that's full of all kinds of nasty awfulness. Christian liberty! That is not the purpose of Christian liberty. The purpose of Christian liberty is to grow in holiness and to allow you to love others and love God better. So the next time you are struggling with, hmm, what decision should I make here? Ask, me, ask yourself, what will allow me to grow in holiness, love for others, and love for God the most? That's what it comes down to. How can I pursue holiness and love for God and others the most? This shows up in so many ways. In our culture, the biggest way I think it shows up right now is in the sexual revolution and the debates that it has caused. I drive past a church all the time on Main Street in Norristown that proclaims from their billboard that love means I never tell anybody they're doing anything wrong, that I just embrace them exactly with all that they believe and I never ever tell them, God says what you're doing is wrong. Is that really love? No, Scripture says that love is defined by God and it emanates from Him. It comes out from Him. He, because it, He is love, He gets to say, 
yes or no. He gets to define the tracks. All right, well, now we get on to the really fun stuff. That was preschool compared to the next one. All right, <clears throat> submitted love displays itself visibly. Submitted love displays itself visibly. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, here we go. <sighs> Y'all have been waiting for this one, haven't you? All right, verse 2. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But, uh-oh, man, don't you hate that? <sighs> he commends us, but I want you to understand there's this area you don't quite have right. That the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So do you see what he's done? There's God the Father, who is the head of God the Son, who is the head of man, who is the head of woman. And I feel the hackles go up immediately. Verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Okay, interesting. But every wife, footnote, if you have the ESV, there's a little footnote that says in verses 5 through 13, the Greek word gune is translated wife in verses that deal with wearing a veil, a sign of being married in first century culture. In Greek, there's only one word, gune, that is translated into two words in English, wife or woman. And one of the challenges of this passage is you have to decide whether you think that Greek word should be wife or woman. Personally, I believe in this passage, it's woman, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But for now, verse 5, but every wife or woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. What? Verse 6, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short but since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Verse 7, for a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Oh, my word, if y'all had tomatoes, I think they'd be flying right now. What is this book we call the Bible? What is it doing? It sounds so chauvinistic. Verse 8, for man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Oh, verse 10. <laughs> verse 10. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Now, in case I forget to come back to that angels thing, let me just address that right now. There's a lot of debate over what the angels thing means. I believe, you can research it on your own if you want, I believe he's talking about angels. This is another one of those where the Greek word can be translated messengers or angels. I think he's actually talking about angels. He's talking about the other created beings in the universe who are looking at what we do. And by the way, some of them really struggled with the whole submission to God thing, and they rebelled and became demons. So there we go again. There's that demonic presence, that theme in the text. Um, okay, verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. I would, Paul. I'm really struggling here. <laughs> Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? Man, Dalton, I'm glad you got your hair cut a while ago. <laughs> But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. In other words, Paul's saying in verse 16, look, if you want to argue about it, sorry, just get happy about it. This is what we do in church. And Pastor Matt left for vacation and said, why did preach on head coverings? So let's do this. Mm. Let's talk about this. What is going on in this passage? Um, well, let's get the context first of all. Let's get some definitions. Context. He's talking about the gathered assembly. So he's not talking about all of life, first of all. He's talking about when we get together as a family. Uh, why do I say that? Well, because he's talking about when, when a woman gets up to pray or prophesy. 
Okay, so though that is a communal prayer. It can be individual, but not prophecy. So that's a communal event. Secondly, prophesize. What's that about? Um, so you need to know that New Testament prophecy, as it was practiced in the church, was different from Old Testament prophecy. We do not believe that the office of prophet still exists. That ended when the apostle John died. And he wrote the book of Revelation, the canon was closed, boom, done. The gift of prophecy is different from as what Peter calls every prophecy of Scripture that is not open to any private interpretation. But Paul speaks of a gift of prophecy that is to be weighed against the, the, sub, the objective canon of Scripture. And Pastor Matt's going to go into that more next week. Suffice it to say, while we believe that the gifts are operative today, including prophecy, we do not practice prophecy in the gathered assembly or our small groups. So there you go, 50% of the reason to wear a head covering gone right there. Whew. All right, <clears throat> so now um, we need to, we're going to look at this passage in two chunks. First one is the overall principle. What is the overall principle and then we're going to look at the practice. So I'll keep you on pins and needles until we get there. So what's the principle that Paul is talking about? And then what do we do with this practice of head coverings? Um, so underlying principle is God's timeless created order. God's timeless created order. In verse 3, look back there with me. We see that, that order of... of um, that structure set up again. Verse 3, the head of every man is Christ, the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So there are four examples of God's created order. Now, let me ask you this. Is Christ equal to the Father? Yes. Is woman equal to man? Yes. He's not talking about equality or value. He's talking about roles and structure in God's created order. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we do that, we need to decide, are we talking about women or wives? Because you single ladies out there are like, it'd be really great if I don't even have to worry about this. If it's just those married women that have to worry about this. Here's why I think Paul is talking to women in the church, not wives. And I just gave it away. It's women in the church. He's not talking about the context of a family. He's talking about the church. And in Paul's writings, he's very clear. He upholds male leadership as elders and pastors. And therefore, if a woman stands up, we don't really do this in our context anymore, but if a woman in the church of Corinth stands up in the gathered assembly and starts to prophesy or pray, she's to show that she's honoring and respecting the proper authority that God has given in the church, right? And so I believe he's talking to women, not just wives. Those who take the opposite view say that, well, in Roman culture, women would put a veil on their heads when they got married. And so therefore, the minute Paul starts talking about head coverings, people are going to know, ah, he's talking about, he's talking about married women. I, I disagree. I think in the context, he's talking to women in the church and He's not just talking to husbands. That's the other thing that's really obvious. He's talking about men and women. Well, that just makes it a little bit more difficult, doesn't it? Because we're usually in conservative evangelicalism accustomed to hearing wives submit to your husbands. But Paul's saying, in some sense, women in the church submit to men in the church. Oh, my goodness. Don't hit me yet. What's he saying? Again, I think he's saying... In the context of prophecy and prayer in the gathered assembly, sub show your submission to the elders, to the, the male elders. Look, ladies, you may be, ladies in Corinth, you may be smarter, stronger, better in every way, but let's go back to God's created order. And are you willing to limit yourself to stay on the tracks that God has ordained, believing that that is the path to greatest freedom and liberty? All right. Now let's go to verse 7. This just gets better and better. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. I'm sorry, we need to go back. 
Verse 4, every man, verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Now, this is really interesting because Paul is uh, talking to uh, men in Greek culture and in Jewish culture, men did cover their heads when they prayed. It showed honor and respect to God. Hmm. And here he's saying, don't cover your head. Hold that in your brain because that's key, I think, to what Paul's doing here. All right, now back to verse 7. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but, oh, good grief, woman is the glory of man? What in the world? Here's how we tend to think about this. We tend to think that, well, here's God in the center, and out here is man who is God's glory, and then we out here somewhere in the solar system, there's woman, and she's the glory of man? First of all, that's not exactly how it works. But let's look back at what is Paul saying? He's saying God chose to create Adam for a specific task and purpose. And then he said it's not good that Adam's alone. He needs a helper, a companion, not a sex toy, not a domestic slave. He needs a helper companion to carry out the work that I have given him on earth to dominate to, to have dominion over, not dominate, but have dominion over the earth, to subdue it, to cultivate it. And he needs a wife to do that. Mankind needs womankind. So what is this thing about woman being the glory of man? Well, look at it this way. If mankind is the crown of glory on God's head, womankind is the glory of the glory. Look back at that text. She, man is the glory of God and woman is the glory of man, which means it's not a dissipation of glory as you go farther out, but an intensification. She is the crown jewel in the crown, so to speak. So, and that's borne out in Proverbs 12, verse 4, which says, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. So don't look at that and say, yep, I knew it. The Bible says that women are some inferior species. I knew it was a chauvinist book. No, no. It says that you are the glory of the glory, which in ancient thinking was an intensification. When you do that, it's an intensification, that grammatical construction. It's saying that we as a race were created to reflect God's glory, and men and women have specific roles in that. And womankind is the crown jewel in the crown. Well, let's look back at verses 8 and 9. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, don't read into that your sinful view of people. It's really hard. I get it. It is really hard to read those verses in light of what sin has done to men. Now, and I'm addressing ladies right here because I'm guessing there aren't a whole lot of men struggling with these verses right now. So I'm talking specifically to you ladies for that reason. Sin has twisted men. And what was originally intended to be something beautiful and wonderful was, has turned into something hard. And yet Paul says, look, this is how God designed it. And if that sounds awful to you, keep in mind that this... Listen up, listen carefully, because this is important. Keep in mind that in John 14 through 16, even though God is always described in all three persons with masculine pronouns, which, by the way, rules out the blasphemy of the shack. <clears throat> but anyway, even though God is always described with masculine pronouns, in John 14 through 16, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit. And do you know how he describes the Holy Spirit? He says, the Holy Spirit is a helper, by the way, who comes from and is the representative of the Son. Comes from and is the representative of the Son. He's the helper. He is the reason we are not left as orphans. He is the mothering arms of God, in other words. On the day of Pentecost, when the church was birthed, who gave birth to it? The Spirit. So, if you begin to think, oh, man, being a woman is just the short end of the stick, Think about this. Who does the church need more, the Son or the Spirit? You can't do without either one of them. 
you eliminate the Spirit and we lose access to the Son. You lose the Son and there's no one to send us the Spirit. You have to have both, and that's exactly how God's created order works when we submit to it willingly and we see the beauty of it and we stay on those tracks. We see this in verses 11 and 12. Nevertheless, in the Lord, in the Lord, that is so important. Not in the culture, not in the world at large, but in the Lord. When God begins to restore the original plan, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. You need both. Verse 12, for as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Here's the point. The first woman came from man. Guess where all the rest of the men come from? Women. Don't be like that woman uh, who tweeted during the women's march, women birth half the population. <laughs> I don't know which is more amazing, that she tweeted it or that it got that many likes. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the Bible's way ahead of you, lady. <laughs> women have an exalted status alongside men because not only did God gift them with the ability to bring forth more people, but the incarnation of Christ forever elevated that role and status. Think about it. God entered through a woman. And for that reason, no woman ought to be sitting here going, man, the Bible just hates women. And this, these texts, this verse just makes me feel inferior. Not at all. If, if so, you're misunderstanding it. But here's what we need to realize. Our culture has twisted this hardcore to the point that feminism is the new chauvinism. And if you want to tweet that, give Pastor Matt credit. That was his quote. But it's true. Feminism has become the new chauvinism. The pendulum has swung the other way. Ladies, your submission to godly authority, hear me say that, to godly authority in the church, and if you have it in your family, your submission to godly authority, even when it is hard, when it is difficult, that is your strength. That is how you show your strength. It's not by the, like the, the recent day without a woman. It's not by staying in bed and throwing an adult-sized temper tantrum until somebody misses you. No, that degrades womankind. What elevates them is when you accept God's role with joy and you go out and you are a fellow culture builder and family builder and person builder along with men and you use your gifts and abilities that God has given you in that role joyfully. All right, so that's the principle. Are we good there? Can everybody take a deep breath? God loves men and women and values them equally. That is without question. So now what do we do with this head covering thing? All right, back to verse 4. Again, men are not supposed to cover their heads in church, according to Paul. Also, before we get into this, let's remember this is a corrective letter, okay? So Paul is writing to correct something that's happening. Um, he says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Once again, this is a shift for Paul from Jewish culture, where men would cover their heads to show honor to God. Why is he saying this? Most scholars agree that the evidence shows that in pagan Roman culture, in a temple, men would cover their heads with a toga as part of their ritual worship. And Paul says, don't do that. Be different from your culture. Don't cover your head because you are the glory of God. And I think that that gives us a clue as to the fact that there might be varying ways within a different cultures to obey this command, which is still very much in existence. So what about the women? Well, it's clear in that in Roman culture, yes, women would, would at least don some kind of head covering when they, when they got married. And we might have a picture of that somewhere. I don't know. At least when they got married, we have some evidence that they would cover their heads at least then. So it seems like what happened was in, in Corinth, the church was this weird new entity where slave and master and man and woman walked in and they were all on level footing. That's pretty awesome, wouldn't you say? That had never happened anywhere else in history. And in come these ladies who apparently that got a little bit too 
heady for them. They got off the tracks. They went from enjoying the liberty to now I'm just off the tracks altogether. And they flung aside their head covering and they're like, great. Not only am I in church on equal footing, but I'm actually going farther and completely subverting all authority and saying, I'm just going to do whatever I want. Paul says, no, that's wrong. Verses, uh, verse 6, look with me at verse 6, where Paul says, For if a wife or woman, by my understanding, if a woman will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. Now this verse disproves the theory that, well, the hair is the covering. That wouldn't make any sense if you read it that way. For if a wife will not have hair on her head, then she should cut her hair short. That just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit. So he's talking about some kind of other covering. But then verses 14 and 15. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. What's he saying? He's making another argument, not only from created order, but from hairstyles. Throughout history, generally, it has been true that men have shorter hair than women, generally. Think about it. If Pastor Matt gets up here with a shaved head, everybody's like, oh, we got a haircut. If a woman got up here with a shaved head, you would think, does she have cancer? Is she trying to make some kind of statement? We somehow know inherently, even apart from the revelation of God in the Scriptures, that there's something about the hair. There's something about that. And Paul says it has to do with glory. It has to do with glory. So he's making these arguments uh, from things that are unchanging and not culturally bound. So we need to be really careful if we're going to say, well, this is culturally, this, this, we just throw this out because it's all cultural. We've got to be really careful because Paul's not using cultural arguments here. But, before you all freak out on me, but it is good to remember that throughout church history, there have been multiple times where this has been observed in different ways. So here we come to our big question. Is, everybody, is every lady supposed to go out of here and get a head covering? I don't think so. If you do, I think that's fine. And we have some in our church who do that, and that is fine. That's great. However, I do think that because, Paul, because of Paul's shift from Jewish culture to Gentile culture, that that says that, look, get the principle of the command and then reflect it within your cultural norm. So think about it. If we all, we all, <clears throat> if you all ladies went out and you got some kind of veiled head covering, what would that say to our culture right now? It would say, I worship Allah. Frankly, it doesn't say, yeah, I'm in submission to authority in my church. That's not what that says. So th is this command still in effect? I think there's not a whole lot of room for us to say it's not. But just like Paul's command or Peter's command to greet one another with a holy kiss, there might be some different ways for this to appear in our culture. Do we need to obey it? Yes, absolutely. How we obey it may differ from culture to culture. And whenever I've heard messages on this, I'm always sitting there going, this is just because you're at a church where ladies don't do this and you don't want to get stoned. <clears throat> However, as I was studying this, I wanted specifically to pick up older commentaries. I wanted to get out of our time zone and look at what others have done. The first one I picked up was by Matthew Henry, <clears throat> who, by the way, has really short cropped hair. And... Matthew Henry was a pastor back in the 1600s, and he was really helpful because in his day and age, when men covered their heads, it was with a crown or a bishop's hat or something like that, and they would uncover their heads not to show a place of glory, but to show a place of subservience before a king. And by the way, men tended to have longer hair. And so he said, yeah, this looks different in our 1600s British culture than it did in Corinth. And I heaved a big sigh of relief because I've always, honestly, I've always worried about that. Like, are we, are we being true to it? And I believe, yes, men and women of God down through the ages have said, 
yeah, this command is still in effect, but the way we carry it out can look different from culture to culture. So that begs the question, what does it look like in our culture? And here's, here's the specific application, and then I'll go broader. Specifically, what you do with your hair and what you wear, it does say something to people around you. It matters. It does matter. We live in an age where the blurring of gender lines is so common, and it's, in fact, being aggressively pursued. So men and women... We ought to, in the way we dress and do our hair, reflect that I love being who God made me to be. I'm not chafing at the bit saying, man, I wish I were a woman. Man, I wish I were a man. No, I love the fact that God made me to be a man or a woman and all that that entails. I am so thankful, God. My love stays on the tracks. I stay within the bounds that God made, and I love it because I believe that that's where the greatest freedom is found, when I am submitted to my God. I love it. But then obviously, to go back to Christian liberty and bring them both together, this has broader applications into every area of our lives. Are we willing to limit our rights, including clothing choices, to show our love for God and for others. So, teen, teenagers, are you willing to maybe not watch that show that your parents allow you to watch but not your younger sibling so that it doesn't cause your younger sibling to disobey and stumble? Are you willing to forego your right for the sake of somebody else? Men, Maybe you have a right to spend a lot of time playing video games and hanging out with the guys, but is that helpful? All things may be lawful, but is it helpful and edifying to your family if you have one? Is it helping others pursue Christ so that they can be saved? Now again, God gave us all things to enjoy, but let's be wise about it and limit ourselves where we need to for the sake of others. Wives, maybe you have the right to set your own course. But are you willing to surrender that right for the sake of your family's needs? Men and women, in our clothing and our hair, as I said, are we willing to surrender our rights for the sake of the gospel? Now, here's the deal. You might be sitting there saying, I am really new to this church thing. In fact, I haven't been to church in a long time, and I walk in, and you're talking about head coverings and meat offered to idols, and I'm thinking, when is this thing over? This is weird. You've talked a lot about what, I'm not sure you've convinced me why. Well, here's the deal. Why should you limit your love? Because love that is off the tracks is not actually love. It's actually selfishness. We call it a lot of things in our culture. Self-love, self-worth, self-esteem. We put it on posters all over our schools, encouraging everybody to love themselves. That's not love. According to God, it's nothing more than good old-fashioned selfishness, and it leads to train wrecks. Look around at our society. Western society is crumbling and unraveling. As we all say, I get to be God. I get to define love. Woke up this morning to the news of more terrorist attacks in London because of people who have the messed up idea that I'm going to somehow get something for myself by killing others. That is, that's me defining love. And it's just not right. And here's the deal. The root of that destructive force lies in your heart. It's like an atom that when split has atomic bomb potential. If you were the only selfish person in the world, you have the potential to ruin it. It happened once in the Garden of Eden. One person and then one more person chose to act selfishly instead of limiting their rights. And it has destroyed so many lives. But God, but God, there's hope because God came as the Savior. He sent Jesus, the ultimate example and power to limit rights. 
He was God the Son. He is God the Son. And He stripped Himself of His rights and came as a human to save you. You say, well, I didn't really ask to be born as a sinner, nor did I ask God to come save me. And there you see, in, even in your own thinking, how selfish you are. You think of yourself as if you are self-determining. You didn't choose when you'd be born, and you're not going to choose when you die. You just won't. Somebody else gets to do that. And he's also the one who gets to define love. And you have a choice whether you will submit your heart to him and his path because he loves you and paid the ultimate sacrifice for you. Or if you're going to keep on going down your own tracks and you're headed for a wreck because God says the wages of sin is death. We see that all around us. The wages of rebelling against God's set path for love is death. And the scripture goes on and says that you will face eternal wrath. This is not a joke. You don't know whether you will have this opportunity to respond to the loving invitation of a God who wants to be your friend and Savior and Father again. So this morning, I'm calling you to consider whether you are willing to submit yourself to a God who loves you and is calling you to himself. He says, if you are thirsty, come. If you are hungry, come. I will give you bread without cost, water that you don't have to buy. Jesus paid the cost of your selfishness on the cross. He took, he limited himself for your sake and took it on the cross. Philippians 2 gives us this, and I'll leave us with this. Paul says, have this mind in yourselves. And the only way to have it is to put your faith and trust in Christ, by the way. Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not think that it was, sorry, I lost my place, <laughs> did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, greedily clutched onto, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, there it is, submission, to the point of death, even death on a cross. But that's not where it ends. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The way to exaltation and joy is the path that God has set. Are you willing to honor it, to love it, to rejoice in it, to submit to it? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for limiting yourself. I cannot even fathom the rights that you gave up for me, Lord. The throne room of heaven, the accolades and praise of angels, the title deed to the universe, and you laid it down because I was not willing to limit my rights. You laid yours down for me and bore the wrath of your Father and I thank you for that, Lord. God, help us this week to live selflessly. Help us to limit ourselves for the sake of others. God, help us to surrender our rights in our home, in the church, in our community, and instead to serve and love. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.